Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Wembley. Uh, what an honor to be here. Thank you for waiting, for waiting, for being here today. Anyway, I have a presentation for you all. It's called Never Give Up, Never Surrender. I don't know why they picked me for that. Anyway, um, what I'm going to tell I'm going to tell you about myself. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But what I'd like you to do is obviously put my story into your world. And I'm hoping that you'll, that you'll answer some of the questions for you. Because I've been on a bit of a journey recently. <laughs> There's me. A little bit about myself. Uh, I, uh, I own a company called Alpha Star Productions. And um, I'm a writer and a director. Um, I've been an editor for years. I got into the business originally as an editor and learned how to put films together, which was a, is a very good skill. I, I live in the world of corporate videos, <laughs> and that's kind of how I pay the bills. That's how I paid the bills over the last 20 years. Um, and, you know, I have become a film producer by default. And um, I, don't think any, I don't know anybody that actually wants to be a producer. Have we got any producers here? Does anybody, oh, we have. Does anyone really want the role of being a producer? We'll have a chat later, <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I never really wanted to be a producer, but it was, it was, it's the only way to get what I wanted to do, to do you know, to do done. Anyway, um, as a young, as a youngster, I was influenced by many things. Does anyone recognize this gentleman here? It's Colonel Steve Austin, six million dollar man. Um, as a, as a five-year-old, he had a massive influence on me. I, I just wanted a, I just loved the world of the $6 million man. And I was hugely influenced by American culture that we had in the 70s here. Uh, anyone know who this is? That's Captain Apollo, Flight Sergeant of the Battlestar Galactica, as he used to say. Um, that was another show that had a massive influence on me. And, um, you know, and it, it, was, it was really the spirit and the excitement of these shows. Um, but... Uh, Anyone remember this? Planet of the Apes. I was a big fan of Planet of the Apes, okay. Um, but actually, in reality, I was this youngster from Basingstoke. I took all my toys that I loved, my models that I'd spent time making. This is my Spider-Man in an aeroplane. Uh, I took them down to Woolies, and I sat in the booth, and I photographed them, and it, it, was, it was this kind of... It was just an expression of this creativity that I had in my heart, and I didn't really know... I didn't really know what it was at the time or what it was going to lead to, but I knew there was something creative in me that I just wanted to, to, to get out. And this little boy has never left me. Okay. And of course, when this one came along, when Star Wars came along, it just transformed my life. Uh, is anyone else here, here affected by Star Wars? <laughs> hey! You look too young. Anyway, okay. Well, that was the dream. That was the dream. And, um, you know, who I wanted to be, I, I like most of us, I don't know, every filmmaker now wanted to be like Spielberg. Jaws was hugely influential on me, and Close Encounters had a massive impact on me. Um, this was the guy I really uh, was mad about, though, George Lucas. You know, what he did to, to cinema just blew me away, and I just wanted more and more information about how he did it, how did he do it, how did he create this, this magic um, and that had such a profound influence on my life and, and a whole generation. Um, but the reality was, this was me, a 17-year-old. I was a chef. I was also this young filmmaker. But I would, uh, I would, you know, I had a Super 8 camera. I didn't even write scripts. Didn't really know about writing scripts in those days. We just, I'd write a little story on a page, and we'd go out and we'd film it. And um, my mum, bless her, bought me this fantastic projector and camera when I was just 13, and it had a huge impact in my life, on my life. Um, and so I used to go out with all the kids on my streets, and we'd make film after film after film. And I loved it. I loved it. I was so pleased to be doing this, this creative thing, just to sort of express myself, you know, creatively. Anyway, uh, years later, VHSC arrived. Does anyone remember VHSC? For the first time ever, you could have picture and sound together on video, and it was instant. Super 8 was a lot, a lot different. Um, now, oh, now I'm going to show you a clip. Oh, God. I'm going to show you a clip from one of my movies. You got any volume on this? This is a sci fi classic called Circles of the World, starring Basin Sets Finest. Where are they? This is tense stuff. East, 25 sectors. 
I picked them up on my scanner. They're closer than I thought. Where? There! Okay, you get the idea, okay? Oh, God, I'm so glad I did that. Oh. You, know when, you know when something seems like a good idea at the time? Um, but this, you know, this was the kind of... I, I love this kind of stuff, I'm not going to deny it. And, um, and it meant so much to me. And, and it was just a great, great days. We'd all go out and we'd do this stuff. And uh, I'd, I'd edit it with two VHS decks and, you know, create something that that I thought was magic, and we'd have little premieres, and it was just great, you know, just absolutely great. Um, anyway, 1988, right, I came to London, you know, I was 22, I'd been a chef, but the calling was in me. I wanted to make films, I didn't know how to get into it. The film industry was this place far away um, where the magic happened, and I just wanted to be part of it. I knew they were making the films here, in London, they were making Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars was made here. And it's like, how do I get in on those films? How do I get in? So I uh, went to London, went traipsing around Soho. That's slightly dodgy there. But anyway, went traipsing around Soho with a CV, which was completely irrelevant, and went knocking on all the doors, just knocking on the doors. I, I, I can have a job as a runner. And uh, I went into a little place called RSA that I'd never really heard of, didn't know anything about it. Um, they took my CV. Then I went round, and a, a little job called Film Fair offered me a job as a runner. So I was so pleased. 30 quid a week, 1988, it was still rubbish money. Um, but I was so pleased. I was in the industry, and I, I was there all day photocopying, and very, very exciting. RSA then rang me up and offered me a job, but I was working at Film Fair. I was photocopying. I was in the film industry. I was really happy. Yeah, you know where this is going, don't you? I found out that RSA was Ridley Scott Associates. So, uh, I always wondered, what, what would have happened? What would have happened? How my career would have, you know, would have changed? But the point is, we make decisions. We make the best decisions we can at the time. And um, we live by it. So, but I was a runner. Oh, became a runner. That's a good. And, and there's me. There's me. Now, the great thing about this company, Film Fair, they made, it was an animation company. And I didn't know anything about animation. But uh, I went from a, a series called Bangers and Mash, and then a job came up in their, in their film editing room, and uh, they took me on as a trainee editor. And uh, it, that brilliant experience. I cut, uh, I'm, you know, I worked on shows like The Wombles, The Gingerbread Man, Huxley Pig, Rod and Emu, and a show called The Dreamstone. Um, but what was really great about working in this environment, we were cutting on film in those days, so we had steam becks, and you'd hang your film up, you'd strip a film, and you'd tape it together. Um, it really taught me how to structure films, how to put them together. And the great thing about these shows is they were basically silent films. And then, you know, we'd record the, we'd, we'd, there'd be a script and you'd have a voiceover, but a lot of them were silent films, so you'd put them together. So they had to work visually. And then, of course, we'd put the sound on and the music, and it, it taught me loads about structure. Really, really important. And that stood me up for the rest of uh, where I, reason I'm here today, to be honest. Um, but I wanted to make a feature film. I was really dedicated. I wanted to make that first feature. And um, so I read this book, Writing Screenplays at Sale. Um, but that taught me how to write scripts. I wrote a couple of scripts. First one was Naked Fear, which was terrible, died a death. But however, after that, I thought, I'll write, I'll write, you know, I'll write a little low budget horror film. Um, and uh, I wrote a script called Written in Blood. And um, I. Uh, I, because I worked in TV, um, what they used to do at Film Fair was they'd make pilots, make a little pilot, and they'd take it around the TV stations, and then they'd get it funded. The series would either would usually get funded. So I thought, I'll make a pilot for, for Written in Blood, or Driven, as it was called at the time. And um, I wrote to 300 distributors. Now, this is before email, okay, so this was letters. I wrote letters. 300 distributors, can I come and show you my pilot and my script? And most of them didn't write back. A handful of them uh, said no, and then two people invited me in. Uh, one guy, I thought it was okay, but I didn't think it would work. But this other guy said, look, I've got a free picture deal. I've delivered two. I've fallen out of everybody. I've got a bit of money left. You can do the third one. So suddenly, 
I've got a movie. Um, but I found it a very hard film to make, and the reason was people came on board and worked, revamped the script. I had a script that was, it knew what it was. It was a kind of Friday the 13th, nice and straightforward. People interfered with it, and it became a monster. It just became huge. Cast, sorry, really big cast, and, and I found it very difficult. And, and um, when I got on set, that was when, that was when I, f I really struggled. There were some big egos there. And, you know, and my first film, when I was only 30, and you know, I was trying to get it going, and, and I was fighting everybody on a script that I suddenly had lost a bit of faith in. Um, and it was too low budget. It was a shot on film, so everything's expensive when you shoot on film. So there wasn't much for anything. And I ended up not paying myself, which seemed like a good idea at the time. But it absolutely, you know, I found it a very devastating experience. And, and I hated the experience. And I'm, you know, the film, the film did all right. It sold all over the world, and et cetera. But, but I didn't see any of it. But that's another story. But it wasn't, it wasn't a good place. However, I was, a f I was a film director. I had made a movie. I was a film director. So I thought, Thank God I've arrived. I've arrived. And I was waiting for the doors to open. But they didn't. They didn't. And um, I don't know why they didn't. It was, the film was competent, technically, but the script wasn't very good. The acting was great. Acting was absolutely brilliant in it, thank God. Um, but it, the script was the problem. And anyway, I, I was happy. I'd made the film. You know, I was getting it out there. Um, I sent it to... A, I, I wouldn't normally name the agency, but I, I'm going to on this case. I send it out to a few people trying to get a director's agent and trying to move on and et cetera. And Peter Fraser and Dunlop came back to me, having watched my film, and this is what they said. Oh. You know, it really hurts. That really hurt me. That hurt me very, very deeply. But I'm over it now, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but at the time, when you make a movie, a low-budget indie movie. I felt like I'd been through the war. I was absolutely battered physically, mentally. I had no money. It was just like, what was all that about? And um, I was, uh, I was not in a good, not in a good place. Um, but you know, I was in well into my thirties at that point, and I, I met, you know, I'd met my lovely wife Angie. We and we were getting married, and and life happens, you know, uh, as my, as Angie, my two girls, Sophie and Gemma, and. Uh, you know, I had to obviously pay the mortgage and do that sort of stuff. So I got, that's when I got into wedding videos. <laughs> Don't ask me how I got into wedding videos, but if anyone wants one. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> but you know, and I became really good at corporate, and I hated corporate. I hate work, and I say it publicly now. Uh, it was not good for my soul, but you've got young family, you've got to do what you've got to do, right? Um, but, you know, that little boy, that little boy was still in me. I still, the passion doesn't go away just because you get older. I'm sure you'll all agree with that. Um, so in 2001, I was, I was kind of getting a bit, I wouldn't say bitter and twisted, but I'd, I was feeling a little bit like, you know, I'm nearly 40, come on, when's it going to happen? Um, I, I'm a child. And I, and I was kind of determined to, to come back from this, because I was a bit battered by the whole experience. I wanted to prove people, I didn't want this to be my legacy. You know, you think you make one film and it's not very good, and then, oh, what am I going to do next? Um, so, I, I, I stopped, I, and I thought, I'm going to write another script, but if I'm going to go through that hell again, at least I'm going to make the film that I want to make, and nobody's going to interfere with it. So, I thought, I'll make an epic sci-fi movie, as you do, okay? Um, but I was going to get this one right, you know, because uh, the other one, I was obviously a new newly experienced writer at that point, and I had people messing with it. I didn't want that, but I thought, I'll do the courses, I'll read the books, I'll get this right, and I did. And it took me years, it took me years. But it's called Kaleidoscope Man. Has anyone heard of Kaleidoscope Man out of interest? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Well, it's not called Kaleidoscope Man <laughs> anymore. <laughs> anyway, um, but I was gonna get this one right, okay? Um, oh, and the other thing I decided to myself, this wasn't just going to be another sci-fi movie. This was going to be the biggest British indie sci-fi movie ever. Now, back in 2002, 2003, sorry, when, it, when I sort of had the script there, I, I made that my mantra because I thought, if I reach for the stars, you know, that old cliche, you might get the moon, I thought, I need to be in that place. And, and I realized it's all right to say it, but to try and deliver that is quite hard. And, um, but, I, but I've kept that with me. I've kept that... that um, what do you call it, mantra, because it, it's what I feel about it. I thought, if I'm going to do this, it's got to be great. It's got to be fantastic. Um, 
And, uh, and you know, I was going to have Six Million Dollar Man influence. It's not going to be a normal sci-fi. This is going to be fun. It's going to have a bit of Battlestar Galactica in it. And it's going to have loads of... Oh, and a bit of that in it as well. Sorry, I forgot about that. A bit of Planet of the Apes. Um, but... It was gonna have, I was going to try and find the magic of Star Wars. What was it about Star Wars? When I watched it as a kid, I remember the special effects are great and, you know, and music and da 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 brilliant. But for me, I was following the story of Luke Skywalker and I got it. I, I just felt for his story and his yearning for more and adventure and excitement. And that's what I wanted. How can I get that into a film without ripping off Star Wars? Um, anyway... And the other thing I was going to do, I was going to do this my way. I was, the, the industry wasn't really working for me as well as I wanted it to. So I, I'd set up my corporate company, um, uh, Storm Rider Films it was called, and I'd moved, lived in the Midlands then, and they were throwing money at me. Money was coming in, all, so, whoa, so I took on staff and built up this empire. And, um, and it was all working really well. You know, I had a nice premises, a mezzanine floor, edit suites everywhere. Really good, you know, great atmosphere. We were there, we were, the, we were the guys that would make your video. But the idea was this was a bread and butter business that would fund my dream, the sci-fi movie. Um, and uh, we made a little pilot, made a great pilot uh, with Steve Moyer from True Blood. Some of you might have seen it. I, I put it all over Facebook years ago. Um, but it was a really good little package. And uh, we, s we spent some money, we were casting it. Um, Tom Hardy... Uh, auditioned, did an audition with him, or read through. Uh, Ewan Bremner as well, who was spot in train spotting, he was, he was up for it. And you know, it was really good, saw some really, really good people. But you know, the good thing was, I was on my way. We had a lovely artist guy came in, did some fantastic concept artwork, uh, and he left me and went on and did Rogue One and all these lovely Star Wars films, Godzilla and stuff. He's done really well for himself. However, when you build empires, they have a habit of falling. And this one fell spectacularly. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but basically it was about money. You, you know, I was trying to get the film funded. I had lots of promises. I had promise here, promise there. Some of it came in, and then suddenly uh, a big dollop that was promised didn't, and the whole thing collapsed. And I'd spent a lot of money at that point. So I was, um, I was in a mess. I suddenly was in a real financial mess. All because of this dream, I, I, I was... The bailiffs were knocking at the door. I'm telling you, this is honest stuff here. The bailiffs came to my house when my wife was there. I was at work, you know, I was in the office to take my camera away. Luckily, she didn't let them in. And then I, was, and then I had uh, loads of things going wrong. Money, we were dead up to my eyeballs, and we had to dis uh, liquidate the company, and it was a mess. I'm like, how the hell did I get into this position? And I thought, this image, this is what I felt. And when you're going through stress, and, and worry at these, in these sort of situations, it's at night. Uh, how, many of, how many of you kind of know what I'm talking about here? You wake up at night in a hot sweat, you're depressed, there's no way out of it. It's like, how the hell did I get here? How did I get here? And, um, it, you know, this, this for me was the low, one of the lowest points of my life. I had two babies as well. It was very, very difficult. Anyway, don't despair. There's a happy ending to this. But, you know, the, the little boy... He was still in me, and I knew, and I'd written this great script. I was really pleased with the script. He was still in me, and I wanted this to, um, I wanted this to work. And um, strange enough, it was after a conversation with this man over here. Chris and I are old mates, by the way. We've, no, we've known each other a good 20 years. And um, <clears throat> I, 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 said, I just kind of made the decision. I'm going to push the button. I was going to do whatever I had to do to get this movie made. And, you know, when you commit to things like that, it was a real definite moment shift in my life. And I was going to find another way because the film industry had let me down. Well, the film industry hadn't let me down. The system wasn't working. It wasn't working for someone like me. At the time, <coughs> Kickstarter and Indiegogo, these crowdfunding platforms were available. Of course, social media was now the big thing. This is about 2012. And so I thought, I'll run a crowdfunding campaign. I'll get, I'll get 60K in. That should get us going. And so um, I set about doing it, and it failed. But I learned loads. I learned loads from this. We raised about £5,000 still, but Kickstarter, you don't get all the money if you don't hit your target. Um, but I could see there were a lot of people out there that got what I was trying to do. I knew there was a lot of sci-fi fans. Uh, I was also at Comic-Con and memorabilia, flogging DVDs of my old film, but also talking to a lot of sci-fi fans. So I knew there was an audience for, for Kaleidoscope Man, as it was at the time. 
Um, but then I looked at the scripts, and without any spoilers here, the couple come together at the beginning, she goes one way, he goes the other, and then will they come back together at the end? So, so really, I had two stories. So I thought, I'll shoot it in phases. That's the way we do it. So rather than try and raise a silly large amount, I'll raise a small amount. And, then, and I ran a campaign on Kickstarter for five grand, and we got seven, and um, 206 people chipped in. 50 quid, 20 quid, 100 quid, whatever. But we raised the money, and I was just like, fantastic. First time, this was real money. This wasn't any promises. This was real money for the film, not for anything else. So I was very, very happy. And I thought, Let's, what's, I need to build a bigger audience here. My network of, you know, isn't really big enough. So I thought, I need to shoot, um, I'll shoot a crowd scene. There's a brilliant scene in the movie where the ships are bombarding the cities. They're flying through the streets, blasting people. people all the crowds are running. So I thought, I'll get, I will do that. So my, uh, my friend Mark and I, we were fairly new to social media. We got on, on, the f on Twitter and Facebook, come and be in our movie, come and be an extra, come and get blasted by aliens. And... Um, and we had all the lights and the cranes. We had it all there. They closed off central Birmingham. And um, 900 people turned up, which was just uh, unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Now, I want to show you, this is what crowdfunding is. I heard someone answer a question earlier about crowdfunding. This is how to engage a crowd. We set this, we set this sh shot up, sorry, this shoot up. And this was the first... This was the first shot we did. Now, if I push that, it should play. This is crowdfunding, how to engage your audience. Go so, roll camera. Oh. One take, one. Here we go, and action! <laughs> <laughs> Even at the time, I didn't know what that many people looked like until they were charging at you. Okay. But they, we had a great evening. We, we shot in, in central Birmingham for about six hours. We shot loads of fantastic crowd scenes. This is a shot of people running behind the car. We're all in the back of the car with the camera, and they're all kind of running to camera. Absolutely brilliant. I uh, had the time of our life. And I was very honest with any, everybody. You know, look, we're crowdfunding this. And the next day, Facebook, my figures shot up, and um, that enabled me, uh, oh, wrong one, that enabled me to, um, to, to, to continue crowdfunding. But something happened here for me this night as well, because I decided to change my attitude. I decided that I wasn't going to say, I want this, I need that, I want this. I wasn't going to say that. Instead, every time I, I knew I needed something, I would work out what it is, and, I, and I'd come from a place of thanks. And I'm not religious or anything like this, but I was... I thought, I'll be thankful. So every time I want it, I go, thank you for giving me this, getting me this far. Thank you for this lovely scene we shot. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids. Da, 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 da. And everything changed. I can't, I can't tell you the importance of coming from a place of thanks rather than a place of need. Hugely important. I'll tell you, that's the secret to success, one of them anyway. Um, so over the next two years, I ran seven crowdfunding campaigns we blitzed the, the hell out of Facebook and Twitter. Um, but we managed to raise about 45 grand uh, from well over 500 people, and it was just fantastic. It, it, it took time, and, uh, and, I, and I shot the film in chunks, small chunks, stepping through it. Um, but um, because I did this, we ended up with about 20 minutes of the final film over two years. But uh, bigger investors came in, and over the following three years, uh, you know, I was able to shoot the rest of the movie. And we, because this is an epic sci-fi, I didn't quite know how much it was all going to cost. So I just found I just had to keep raising money. Uh, but we shot big tank scenes. We got tanks in to central Birmingham and soldiers. We shot on Lanzarote as an alien planet scene. Uh, we shot all, main, most of it was in the UK was done in Birmingham. And we did loads of green screen. And it was just great fun. Um, and we shot with the actors pretty much over a sort of six months period, and then there were lots of other bits that we, sh we shot. Now, when it came to creating the special effects, of course, this was an epic sci-fi movie. I'd always imagined we'd have a lovely team of animators sitting there, and I'd go, guys, let's have a close-up. <laughs> Didn't happen. Uh, I couldn't afford, this is, that's a, a stock shot, by the way. It's not anybody I know. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we couldn't afford a team of animators. Um, I, I, 
I had a friend in Poland that had been so supportive, CGI guy, he did loads of, loads of the really complicated shots. Um, and and one, one, there's a scene in a space station which took him a year, so it, it was a lot of work. Um, but I had to learn it myself. Now, I was in my 50s, uh, early, I was 50 probably when, when I got to this. I had to learn how to do CGI myself. Now, I have to confess, I didn't do the spaceships. I had somebody, I brought in a guy who did them kind of flying overhead and flying in and spinning around on what we call a composite layer so I could superimpose them onto a background. So I would shoot all the backgrounds. Then I'd bring it all together and, and make it real. But I did all the lasers and all the stuff and all, this, you know, all the kind of CGI stuff. Uh, it took two and a half years. And I, I, I did this by watching YouTube videos, tutorials. And, you know, and I just had to get on with it. And there were so many shots. I think uh, we had, um, I, I can't remember what it was. We had more f shots, more effect shots than the first Star Wars had. Um, so in Feb 2019, the movie was finished. And this is a picture of uh, uh, my old mucker Chris who, who introduced it and uh, we did a talk on stage. 300 lovely people came to Birmingham to watch Kaleidoscope Man as it was called at the time. So I'd done it. I'd made the epic sci-fi movie and it went down very well, pleased to say. So next job, distribution. Now I purposely held back from distribution because I didn't want to show an incomplete film. It didn't make sense. There was too much green screen in it. It was just a mess, and I wanted it as near as damn it. And I was advised by a big producer that that was probably the best way. So distribution, not a bean of interest. Uh, I was one guy said, well, why have you copied a Hollywood movie? I'm like, it's not, it's a British movie. Um, another one was, well, it's very difficult to pigeonhole. And, and part of that was, th was the name, I think. But I just found, this is this year, I just thought, what the hell have I done? You know, I've just, spent my, my, I've just spent 20 years nearly of my life trying to get this thing going. Um, so um, I was back there. I was back in that place for a, few, for a while. I was feeling a bit low. I was screening the film. Uh, to, and everyone was lo loving it. Screening it to, you know, test audiences. Uh, but I just wasn't getting anything back. And I just felt quite, it was pretty depressing. But, you know, I learned some, I learned some good things from this. The journey is not over until you say it is. It really, it's your decision. If you fail, it's your decision. If you, you either keep going or you fail, so decide. That sounds very righteous, doesn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and your path will be lit littered with failure. You're going to fail. Uh, you know, I know some of you guys have probably been around. I'm probably teaching to suck eggs. I don't know. But um, failure is part, of the, is part of the job, I'm afraid. Um, but also, when you fail, you learn lots. And in a way, I'm quite pleased when failures come now because I can move, oh, that's that out of the way, I can get on with it now. Um, and you have to take risks. Now, I put not with your life because some people will, will, younger people will tend to do things that are a bit too risky. You don't need to risk your life, but you've got to take risks. Um, one lesson I learned, don't hurt people. You know what, this is a people business. Uh, you, see, you know, the old cliche, you see them on the way up, you'll see them on the way down, and you will see them, okay? Um, <coughs> This was really important to me, ask for help. I'd never really, <laughs> I could do it myself. Um, once I started asking for help, doors opened. And, uh, and in return, I was trying to help. And it's, it works, it works. And this is really important. You've got to surround yourself with people that believe in you. Not sycophants, but just people that are on the same page as you. And, you know, and that's why I'm very lucky to have such a wonderful wife. She believes, <laughs> she bless her. She, she, uh, she stuck with me all this way, and she's been through the wars, as I have. Um, and, and when I talk about being through the wars, we're all, we've all got stuff going on. You know, I know this, I'm no exception, um, but you know, it's just, uh, it's just part, of, part of the course. Um, gra gratefulness and thankfulness has helped me immensely. Coming from that place has made a huge difference. And the big one is trust yourself. Once I started trusting what was in here, doors opened. When I started listening to everybody else and trusting what they were saying, that was when a lot of the problems came. So you know in your heart what's right. Okay, um, <clears throat> and this is really important to me. Sometimes that little boy there in Woolies, uh, that's, that's, that's who I am inside. And we've all got that person in us, that place that we go to. Sometimes you need to take that pot of magic, stick it on your shoulder and whip it out occasionally because uh, it, you, you get battered, you get, as you'll know. You can get battered by this stuff. Anyway, and just get on with it. Stop messing around, get on with it. And that's what I should do. Right, anyway, so... 
I had this few weeks of depression <laughs> or misery because I couldn't get my film funded. But I got back on the phone, I picked myself up, slapped myself, um, and just got on with it. Got on the phone, emailed, did the, just did the work. And a company called Monroe Films, I, I rang this guy up, spoke to him, he got it. He got exactly what I was trying to do, showed him the film, he loved it, he could see exactly what it is, he knew exactly where to place it, and he was on side. Then in turn, he introduced me to a company called Lightbulb Distribution, and uh, they, they were going to handle, he was going to handle, Monroe was going to handle theatrical, and uh, Lightbulb were going to handle DVD and digital in the UK. Okay. I'm going to show you the little trailer now. Here we go. Massive explosions are being reported in Mexico City, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. President Waterman has warned the governments of the world to brace themselves. I love it when the floor rumbles. That's really quite nice. Um, yeah, so there it is. That's the trailer that's just, just come out this week. So we're very, very excited about it. Um, but this is what happens when you push yourself out there. Guess who joined us recently? View Cinemas. Okay, so this, remember, this is a micro-budget movie. Um, Invasion Planet, we changed the name. Invasion Planet Earth. Come on! Uh, in cinemas, so uh, it does happen. I got, you know what? I'm in, a, I'm in a permanent state of excitement at the moment. <laughs> it's probably not a good thing, um, but um, it, it's it's happened. It's happened. The perseverance has paid off, and and you know, I'd say to all of you, it's just about keep going, okay? Um, and also, oh, it goes on. Sorry, I forgot about this. It gets better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I'd met Lightbulb, they introduced me to this, this British distributor that distributes in America. They're going to release it in uh, America and Canada in February. And then uh, they introduced me in turn to a company called High Octane Pictures, who are an American sales agent. They're going to release it in China, Russia, all over the world, basically. But they reckon we'll get a theatrical release in Japan. <laughs> so I, I, you know... And, you know, I keep thinking of that young chef from Basingstoke. It does happen. It does happen. Right, it's taken a few years, but it does happen. And this quote, you know, when I was really in my depths of despair, this young lady, I, I, this is how bad it was. I was selling DVDs of, um, I made a little tourist film called Discover Warwickshire to try and make some money. And I was flogging it on, on Warwick Market. Every Saturday I was there, and it was bringing in just enough to pay the bills and just keep, because I had young kids, I was really worried about earning enough to survive. She, I, I just got talking to her and she, she emailed me that evening. She said, I was so inspired to meet you and she sent me this quote. I'll read it out to you, okay? You might have heard of it, but it's quite a famous quote. Um, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than, unsex than unsuccessful people with talents. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omni omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and will always solve the problem of the human race. Now, I need you all to come and see the movie. <laughs> right. uh, the, 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 the thing is, the distributor... Uh, 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 it's absolutely brilliant. They're, they're lovely, these guys. But uh, they're like, well, you have given us a handful of cinemas. If we can get tickets booked in, they will extend it. And uh, it's showing in, in a couple of screens in London, and it's showing in about uh, 10 places at the moment. Um, we, I don't have the Hollywood market, marketing machine behind us. So 
We need, it's grassroots, I'm afraid. It's, it, we all, if you guys can come and see it, I'd be so happy, all right? All right you can, if you look on my website, invasionplanetearth.com, uh, there's a list of all the cinemas there you can book and see, and that would be much appreciated. So um, I hope that was interesting anyway, because that's it, guys. But thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you all. And I, all right.